Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and hello, everyone. So I actually had an introduction slide, but uh, yeah, so my name is Alex. No need to bother with that Alexander thing. I am Martin Oderski's freshest or newest PhD student. I have been working on adding JDT support to Doty for, uh, for basically a year now. I may, but no promises, actually understand uh, what that JDT support is about for Doty, and uh, today I would like to share that. So, uh, first off, I would actually like to ask you a question. How many people feel they know what JDTs are? That is, that is actually less than I expected. And how many people have tried or attempted to use them in Scala 2? Okay. So uh, those people, so Scala 2 also had uh, support for JDTs, uh, but from what I've talked with uh, those people that tried to use those JDTs, they said that it uh, basically did not actually have that. So, uh, so if I wanted to say what's actually different in Doty, then uh, what I would say is that we actually have JDT support. Uh, but first things first, so, uh, so GDT is a generalized algebraic data type. And uh, I mean, where's the problem in that? So <laughs> the problem with the name is that this is essentially uh, Haskell terminology that uh, doesn't tell anyone unfamiliar with Haskell anything. And uh, it's, it's also confusing for people that write Scala because uh, we don't actually have ADTs and GDTs. Uh, in Scala 2, we had sealed traits and case classes and case objects, and if we tried hard enough to convince ourselves, then we could write something which we thought was an ADT or a GDT. Uh, okay. Uh, right, I actually lost where I was. Uh, right, so in Doty we have this enum syntax, which kind of accidentally uh, makes actually it, makes it very easy to distinguish what an ADT and a GDT is. So uh, here we have a typical example of an ADT, the option. So uh, well, everyone knows what an option is. Maybe not everyone is familiar with uh, uh, enum syntax. And I promise you that I made for those of you that have seen Martin's keynote, I promise that I made this before him. So I did not steal the idea from him. So this is basically syntax sugar for the definition below. So really enums just allow us to omit a few things, but they are, they are a more ADT-like syntax for, for the same old sealed uh, classes and case classes and case objects. Now, I said that this thing is actually an ADT. And the very easy way to tell is that we have no extens clauses. So if we have extens clauses, then we are dealing with, an, with a GDT. So uh, here's the typical example of that. So uh, we have an expression, a well-typed expression GDT, and uh, we have a very simple expression tree. So uh, we have two literals. We have an int literal that extends an expr of int have a bool literal that does the same, for, but for boolean, and we have an if that has a, a cont which is always an exp of boolean, and has two branches which are exp of t. So the interesting thing with this happens when we try to evaluate it. So uh, here's why, how we can try to do that. So uh, it's, it's quite simple. We, we take in an exp of t, we promise to return a t. If we have a literal, then we return the value contained inside. If we have an if, then we evaluate the condition and then evaluate the appropriate branch, right? So like very simple thing, and there is nothing suspicious going on here, right? I mean, it does compile, so it shouldn't be anything, shouldn't be anything fishy going on here except that, well, we have promised to return a t, and we are actually returning a boolean. So uh, that's, that's kind of weird, and, uh, but it's actually correct that we can do that. And the reason that we can do that is that we have matched on e, and e is an expr of t, and we have checked that it is a bullet, which is always an expr of boolean. So that means that t must be the same at this point as boolean. And this, this is actually what GEDTs are about. It's not that 
it's not about just having an extens clause. It's that when we pattern match on this thing, we uncover additional information about the types in scope, and we can use that to write more interesting functions, such as this one. Uh, right, so uh, that's one way to look at expert, but there is another interesting property that it has, and it's that it is, it's actually a well-typed expression. So if we try to pass something that would not evaluate to Boolean as a condition to if, then that will not compile. If we try, if we have mismatched branches as an if, then that will not compile either. So another way to look at how we have defined expert is that we have forced it to be well-typed at compile time. And this helps us because if it could be ill-typed, then that would mean that we would need to then uh, we would need to essentially have a class cast exception somewhere in eval. Uh, right. So this is one example of a GDT. Another example of a GDT, which we saw previously, uh, is the list with type level length. So uh, uh, it's called vec, like we have heard, and. Uh, it, like a list, it has two cases. It has a case vinyl, which is a vec of nothing and zero. So the zero thing, which we have seen previously, is just this uh, type level integer that we have in both Doty and Scala 213. And then we have a cons, and cons actually does this interesting thing where its tail is a vec of length L, and then it extends a vec of length S of L. So S is this thing, is what we have imported from Scala compile time package, and that's basically a match type that allows us to increment the integer by one. So we have essentially said that the length of cons is one more than the length of tail. So the way this works is that if we cons something with nil, we get back a list of length one. If we cons something with that, we get back a list of length two. Now, the way we can use this is that uh, we can actually restrict the inputs to functions. So here we have a zip function defined on vectors, and uh, I don't know about the, the people here, but I always have a problem with normal zip. I can never seem to remember what it's going to do when we have a list of mismatched lengths. So uh, this is one way to deal with this problem, because we have said that the length of both vex here must be L. So that means that we just cannot pass mismatched lengths, right? Problem solved. And uh, another interesting thing about this is that uh, those cases are actually an exhaustive match. So uh, if we were dealing with normal lists, then we would also need to consider a case for cons and nil and nil and cons. But here, since uh, if we have a vcons, then length must be a successor of something, and not zero, then we cannot have a nil here. Uh, the pattern exhaustivity checker actually didn't know that. This was a long-standing bug in Scala and also a long-standing bug in Haskell. And for us, it was actually, it's also fixed in, in Doty. So uh, there's no need to worry about that either. Right. And uh, finally, uh, a, maybe a very fundamental example of a GDT is EQ. So EQ is essentially evidence that two types are equal to one another. So here we, it's just defined using this funny trick where we have a single, where we have a case that accepts a single type and then it passes it to both type parameters. So now we can actually use it like a sort of better equals colon equals. So here we define the sum function that takes a list of int and now, for some reason, we have a, a function that takes a list of t's, that takes an evidence that uh, t is equal to int, and that first matches on eq, and then sums the thing. So this is not something that we could actually do easily with equals colon equals without extending it further. And uh, we would essentially need to map over t's, which would have a runtime cost. But here, since we, had, since we are actually using the type system, uh, we can just pass the list to, to our sum function. And uh, another thing which EQ makes it easy to show is that it makes the type equality go deep in a sense. So if we have an, a function which has an evidence of equality between vector t and vector of int, 
then that essentially means that t must be equal to int, right? So that means that we still can convert a list of t to list of ints. And then if we have, uh, if we have evidence of equality between a and b and c and d, then that means that a must be equal to c and b must be equal to d, right? So that means that we can convert a map of a and b to a map of c and d. So, uh, yeah, so this showcases how, how tight equality. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, this uh, did not work at all with Scala 2. Thank you. Right. Um, so not, now that we have seen those examples, I would like to conclude. I would actually like to show a bit more, but we don't really have time for that. So now I would like to conclude with the examples of JDTs that people have used. So uh, JDTs naturally lend themselves to interpreters, right? Because we want to pattern match on something, then we watch, want to find out type evidence, then we use that to record, do something interesting with that. Uh, but actually, multiple things can be viewed as interpreters if we try hard enough. So, for example, JDTs can and have been used to ensure that queries are well formed. For instance, OCaml has a JDT based GraphQL package. Uh, JDTs can be used to ensure that complex transformations are well formed and that the types agree. So, for instance, DARKS is this uh, complicated package. Uh, uh, repository history management system like Git, I forgot the term, uh, that is written in Haskell and that actually uses JDTs to ensure that the transformations it composes uh, agree with each other. But also this can be used, for instance, for stream transformations probably, definitely. And also uh, another usage of JDTs is that we use them to ensure that an invariant of a data structure is maintained. For an example, uh, we can use them to ensure that red, black trees are balanced, are compile time, or just simply will not work. And uh, one particularly good use case, uh, good case study of JDTs that I have found is, is Stitch. And Stitch is uh, a basically a, an implementation of a type safe STLC REPL in Haskell. So uh, for those of you that understand those words, this might be the document that you want to read. Uh, right. So now we go to the features of JDTs that are actually unique to Scala. And first off, I am quite happy to say that we are the first language to properly support variant JDTs. Well, Haskell does not support them because it doesn't have variants. OCaml does support them, but has an interesting idea of what support means. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, our expert can be made covariant, which, well, makes sense, I think. Expressions kind of should be covariant, and uh, eval will continue to compile, and uh, maybe that can be used to handle an expression which evaluates to an int or boolean, I'm not sure, but we also can, uh, can do something potentially more interesting. So if we just add a covariance annotation of, on one of parameters of EQ, then we get something that well, we may as well call sub. And sub is evidence of subtyping between two types, which, can be just, which works basically like, like EQ. So uh, here, we get, here we have a function that gets a T, that gets evidence that T is a subtype of int. And now if we unpack this evidence, then we can assign a T to int, but we cannot assign an int to T, like we would expect with subtyping. Um, right, so uh, unfortunately I don't have too many very good use cases, uh, too many good uh, examples of a covariant JDTs, because, well, we kind of don't have any. <laughs> Yet, right. Uh, but that's not the only thing that we have. So we also have, we also can get JDT constraints from normal classes. So uh, here we have a tag of T, a, an int tag that extends a tag of int, and uh, we have a function get, which takes a tag of T, uh, checks if it is an, an int tag, and returns a zero, right? So this, this actually, <laughs> 
So this actually means that in this case, uh, t must actually be equal to int. There is no other way around this. Um, actually, don't see the next slide. Right, so this actually, this might make uh, some of you wonder, uh, how do we actually infer those JDT constraints in Doty? Um, well, the answer is complicated, but I will try to guide you through it. So basically, the guiding intuition is that we try to infer all the necessary constraints that follow from, from pattern matching. So we want to infer all of them because, well, those things are true, and if they are true, then they should be visible in the type system. And we want to infer the necessary ones because if something is unnecessary, then it may not be true. And if it may not be true, then it leads to a crash. So if we, if we take a look at the example that we have seen previously, so here we have inferred that t is equal to int. And uh, well, if we try to think how, how we came to this conclusion, then we might think that pattern matching is essentially narrowing down the type of the scrutiny. And uh, so maybe this is because the pattern type must be a subtype of the scrutiny type. It seems to work in this case, right? Well, it very quickly actually stops being the case. So if we simply make a C tag, a covariant tag, and uh, if we write something very similar, then uh, should we allow this to compile? If we think that we get constraints, constraints based on subtyping, then maybe. And the answer is actually that we shouldn't because, uh, because if we just uh, extend our T1 tag further, if we narrow down its type parameter more, and if we call our function with that, then we will expect to get a T2. But, well, what we will actually get is a class class exception, because, yeah, because we have thought that it's fine to return a T1. So we do not, we cannot allow get to compile, we do not allow it to compile, and uh, we may need to think about how we actually infer those constraints. So, so let's, let's go back and let's think about what's going on in pattern matching. So a pattern is essentially something that tests if the scrutiny is of some type. This is actually a very good intuition for Scala. It doesn't work for Haskell, but it definitely works for Scala. And uh, if we had, oh, well, um, hmm. So if we had a T1 tag, then uh, what we have tested and what's important for us is that we have tested that T, which is of type C tag of A, is also of type C tag of T1. But if, if we think about that, then we can have, if we start with nil, then that's a list of nothing. And we can upcast a list of nothing to a list of string and to a list of int, right? And there is no relationship between to those parameters at all. So um, really, here also, there does not need to be any relationship between those parameters. So what's actually going on is that in pattern matching, there must be uh, a specific relationship between the corresponding type parameters. So with the previous invariant example, we have checked that a tag of T is a tag of int. And since the type parameter is invariant, then that must mean that those things are the same and that t is the same as int. But if the parameters are covariant or contravariant, then we only can ever get uh, constraints from that in very specific cases. So one of those cases are uh, final classes. So if we just made
I have some more things to show. Oh, this works. <laughs> I mean, I haven't looked at any of the stuff yet. I mean, I've seen all the stuff come to France, but I'm actually seeing it. It's like, really encapsulated. It's like, really, really <laughs> okay. Uh, do I get a time extension? <laughs> right. Uh, so, uh, right, we were at this, we were at inferring uh, constraints from covariant type parameters. So if our class is final, if we just made our T1 tag final, then uh, we would actually get a constraint from that. And the reason for that is that the type parameter cannot be further refined from T1. It cannot be a subtype of that. It cannot, because the class is final. So we actually get the constraint and we get to play with it. And uh, the enum that I have showed previously, the covariant expert, also works because of that, because the cases of enum are final. And for compatibility with Scala 2, we have implemented a special case uh, restriction on case classes so that they never violate this, the, the relationship that we assume here, as in the, their children, if someone really wants to do that, uh, do not violate this assumption, so we get this, uh, this constraint inferred as well. Uh, right, so uh, now that we have seen how covariant, uh, covariance affects uh, type constraints, let's go back to invariance. So we also have this interesting case if we try to have a union in the pattern. So let's say that we define an str tag, which is a tag of string, an invariant tag, and now we try to check if a tag of t is an int tag or an str tag. And now the question is, what should we actually find out from this? And uh, well, I have mentioned that we infer the things which are necessary. So uh, what we get, and here we have checked that tag of t is an int tag or an str tag. So it's really, there really isn't anything that's necessary, right? So we don't actually get any constraints from that. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's clear. Um, right, and similar thing happens if we had a union in the, in the scrutiny type. But there is another interesting case that we should deal with it, uh, that we should deal with. And it is the case where one of the branches of union cannot possibly match. So if we try to simulate option like this, then, uh, and we check if the value that we have is an int tag, then int tag and unit cannot ever intersect, right? So if this pattern matched, then it must be the case that t is the same as int. And we get this constraint. Uh, right, and there is another uh, detail that I want to show. So what happens if we get, uh, if we extend tag of t further down? So, and, and, we tr and we try to pattern match on that. So here we are pattern matching on a primitive tag of t, and we are checking if it is an int expert. So the constraint, intuitively, that the constraint that we should get is also that t is equal to int. But here, really, this, this showcases that that there also cannot be any subtyping relationship between the scrutiny and the pattern type because there is no way to make an int expert a subtype of primitive tag. 
So uh, what happens here actually is that first we upcast primitive tag of t to a tag of t to something that uh, int expr inherits from, and then we uh, infer the JDT constraints. And actually, so I've given out multiple rules for how to infer those constraints, and actually the overall process kind of, look, kind of looks like this. So first we branch on intersections or unions if either of the types contains that. Then if either of the types violates single inheritance, then we declare the branch impossible. Uh, then we upcast the scrutiny type. Then we upcast the pattern type if necessary. Uh, then we infer the constraints from a subtyping between type parameters. And then uh, if the constraints are contradictory, we declare the branch impossible, kind of like with, uh, when we evaluate single inheritance. So uh, really, this is, this is kind of complicated. So I think it's more useful to instead give everyone an intuition as to where those constraints come from. And uh, that intuition is that a pattern tests that scrutiny is of the pattern type, and GDT constraints are the, the facts that necessarily follow from a value being both of scrutiny and pattern types, right? Okay. Yeah. So uh, thank you, everyone. And thank, thanks a lot. And I'm pretty sure that if the implementation of this uh, projection system had used GADTs, that wouldn't have happened because <laughs> the error would have been caught at compile time. That uh, joke came too late to me. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, sorry, can you go to slide 12? 12. Yep. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, is that the one? Uh, a few more, right? Is in uh, oh, okay. Numbers there, yeah. Oh. So, I mean, uh, with, because for in in Scala two in usually we will use like implicit for for evidence exactly yes pattern. so in Scala three is it can I assume that it would be trivial to make like the GADTs with enums as a delegate and then pass in using the given mm -hmm. syntax uh, yes that would still be possible but it would also be still necessary to pattern match on it. Okay. So we don't just infer constraints just because it's an implicit in scope. Okay. And thank you. <laughs> okay. Potentially. One more question. So for the slide where you showed um, in tag or unit. Mm, come again. <laughs> The int tag or unit, um, and you pat the so the pattern match only had the int tag. What happens if t is a unit? Like, um, what would nothing um, explodes? What? No, I mean, um, what happens to the generic t? Do we? Is that just nothing? Um, could you repeat the question? What happens with? So let's say I want to do something on the case where little t is none, aka unit, um, mm -hmm. what information do I have in that case? None. Okay. None. But then how would I, mm, so if I, I want to say like case unit return some default int. Uh, well, you, it's not possible because this function was generic and uh, it's if, if the, if the, the argument was unit, then it was not necessary for t to be uh, int. So uh, it will not let the type, type check. You could try to use a instance of, and then the thing would explode if someone passed uh, an STR tag. But you actually want this to pass as a parameter of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you.